Um, back to you, sorry, our introductions. We have Damien Targo, who is an animal health economist with a PhD in economics from the Toulouse School of Economics. He's currently working as a program and uh, policy support officer in FAO, Mexico, and was previously the coordinator of ECTAD's work on socioeconomics in Asia, including performing value chain analyses, impact evaluations, and the application of economic tools for animal, animal diseases prevention and control. We also have Claire Daly, who is an impact measurement and management professional currently working at Cargill on the USAID tra funded Transform project. Claire has a master's in development studies from this, the London School of Economics and is interested in combining traditional and emerging evaluation approaches to help teams improve project design and implementation. I'll pass the floor over to Claire, um, who I must say a big thank you to for joining us very early in the morning to kickstart the session. Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ashma. Um, and Damien, you can jump ahead to two slides from here. Great, thank you. So as Ashma said, I'm the Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Manager for the USAID funded Transform Project, which is a five-year public-private partnership with USAID and a consortium of partners led by Cargill. At a very high level, our goal is to increase access to safe, affordable, high quality animal source nutrition and promote global health security through improved animal agriculture practices. And uh, you can go to the next slide, Damien. We are currently operating in India, Kenya, and Vietnam across a range of species you can see here, depending on the country. And we work across all production sectors. So that means we work with smallholder or backyard farmers all the way to large scale commercial farmers. Next slide. Our work is organized mainly around four primary activities, which you can see over on the left. Um, and these are activity streams or components. We won't go into all of them today, but if you are interested in learning more about Transform, please just pop a note in the chat and happy to share about our other components. Today, we're really focused on our on-farm practices component, which really focuses on building farmers' capacity to implement on-farm biosecurity, farm management, and antimicrobial use stewardship practices that reduce the risk of antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic and, and transboundary animal diseases, improve farmer productivity and profitability, and in turn promote our end goal, um, which is again, increasing access to safe, affordable um, animal sourced foods and promoting global health security. So, this is our high level theory of change for the transform process pro project, which is really our development hypothesis. And so as we started as a project to think about how we might actually measure our progress and our impact against this theory of change, we, we really grappled with the question of, of how we could do that effectively, especially when considering the concepts of reducing or mitigating risk exposure for farmers. And so as we were thinking about this and knowing we had to keep our budgetary um, and time frame constraints in mind, we really wanted to explore further what other approaches similar projects had taken and what challenges they had experienced and if any solutions had emerged, which is how I connected with Damien and began sharing ideas and experiences and inspired us to bring the discussion to the group. So with that, I'll hand over to Damien, who is going to provide an overview of his project that he was working on when we connected, as well as some of the emerging challenges that we have experienced ourselves or identified um, through some literature. So with that, over to Damien. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so similar to, to Transform, in FAO, we have a couple of projects. Well, I would say many projects working on improving biosecurity practices. One of those that I've been involved is um, the ECTAD program funded by the Global Health Security Program from USAID, which has a very similar scope to actually Transform. Um, it's in, in Asia, it started in October 2022, uh, will finish in September 27. It has more than nine countries, I think, at this point. 
And uh, in the, the statement of work, that is kind of the document that uh, outlines the areas of, of work uh, of, for, for this program, there are four focus areas for Asia. Uh, the first one is One Health Coordination and Collaboration. The second one is uh, Building Multidisciplinary Workforce and Institutional Capacity. The third one is Technical Support for Preparedness and Response. And the last one, which is the one I will uh, focus today, is the one on biosecurity and evidence-based policies. Um, another project um, that is being run in, in Asia that probably many of you uh, have heard about is um, the ASF project funded by the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, which focus on strengthening field capacities for ASF detection and emergency response. The first two phases started from September 2019 to September 2022. In the first phase, it was uh, basically uh, focused on capacity building, trainers of trainers, information education and communication material, and then on phase two was trying to um, uh, introduce or pilot a, a risk reduction approach for small colders that it has been named as CAVI for Community ASF Biosecurity Interventions. And it was piloted and evaluated in the Philippines. And now this project has moved to phase three, where the idea is to upscale this bottom-up approach, uh, the CAVI approach, uh, which is very similar in nature to the, to the PMP tab approach uh, and, and piloted in, in a variety of local contexts. So I was also involved in this project. And from these two projects, I came up with different challenges that now I would like to share with you. And the idea is not only to share um, the challenges, but also trying to work together to find some, some uh, practical solutions for everyone. I will jump uh, straight into the, the challenges that we have faced to measuring the impact of biosecurity interventions. This is kind of the boring part. Claire will, will take over uh, after I present the challenges and that will be a more participatory uh, session. Um, but basically one of the biggest challenges is that um, there are good years and bad years. And imagine that, the, and these are just the maps of, of Vietnam uh, mapping uh, ASF outbreaks in 2018 where the disease was not uh, circulating in the country. And then in 2019, it was introduced and it went through throughout the country. And as, as this example, I can share with you many other examples uh, from Asia. So imagine that you have a, implemented a very mediocre biosecurity program leading only to marginal improvements in 2018. And imagine that there is another project where you have a great, uh, a great team uh, uh, promoting biosecurity interventions, and that led to great improvements in the adoption of good practices, but it happened in 2019. If you are trying to look at what is the impact of your program, then because of ASF and because of the huge challenges that uh, it, it represented, uh, then probably you will end up with uh, the opposite results. You will have a 2019 program that didn't uh, lead to, to very good results. And instead in 2018, even uh, marginal improvements could uh, have a, a, a larger impact than those big improvements in 2019. And the idea is that with impact evaluation, we don't want to be affected by when your program was implemented. Um, so how, when we look at the literature, how this could be tackled, well, uh, it could be that in a selected area, unusual events, and this is, uh, we're talking about disease outbreaks, take place once every five years. So if we look at year one where there is no event, then um, uh, adopting a technology to reduce risk mm -hmm. that is costly might be seen as a bad decision. And we are going to talk a little bit more about this, um, but then when the the problems happen, so in this case, in year four, then it's good to have uh, this risk mitigation technology, right? And this could be any kind of, of technology, and I'm, I'm also talking about biosecurity as a technology. Uh, but this is not how uh, risk reduction technologies are, are evaluated. 
Um, so the idea is that uh, one option that we have is to expand the time frame of our evaluation to include at least one unusual event. Now, the problem is that we don't know when this unusual event takes place. So it might be once every five years, once every 10 years, you need resources to do this monitoring. And the idea is how do you convince the donor to look at this evaluation timeframe for 10 years? Uh, where are you going to get all those resources? And that's the challenging part. So basically with this example, uh, we you should kind of understand that before and after uh, frameworks uh, for impact assessment it can be biased because it doesn't really control for the temporal dimension of risk. Uh, one option that we have, as I just mentioned, is to expand the time frame for the evaluation. So you include some of these unusual events and as a risk mitigation uh, technology, in this case, biosecurity, you can kind of uh, assess the impact. Another option that we have is to find proper control units that face the same threats over time. Uh, but there is a huge challenge in doing this uh, because as I will show you later on, it's very hard to ensure that actual the, your treatment and control units are actually facing the, the same uh, threats in an ex post uh, way. And to put this in a, a more clear way, consider that you have two farms, farm A and farm B, that look exactly the same in terms of biosecurity, practices, business models, awareness. They, they are exactly the same. Uh, but, uh, and actually they are both located in settings with similar risk exposure. But imagine that in, in farm B, you have the sick bird uh, flying uh, close to the farm that ends up infecting the farm. So the idea is that it's very challenging to control for these, uh, these kind of uh, uh, events. Even if ex ante, the farms look exactly the same. You will have one that simply had bad luck and got infected. So the idea is how, or the challenge comes, how to find the right control units to control for any exogenous factor. In this case, it was this wild bird flying into the, into, into, into the farm. Um, one solution is expanding sample size and using randomization. And this is basically the randomized control trial approach. Uh, where on average, we can expect that we are controlling for any exogenous factor. Uh, now, even using randomized control trials, you will find that sometimes you, you are not simply controlling perfectly. It's, it's just very challenging. And here is one example of a very nice paper doing random control trials for poultry. They use mortality rates as the outcome variable and they actually find that the opposite results of that they were expecting. So the intervention villages where they were promoting biosecurity had higher mortality uh, than controlled villages. So this is one of the challenges. And then when the authors explain the results, they say that there was this unusual event in the treatment farms where um, that it, it was impossible to control ex ante. And that was kind of uh, leading those uh, negative results. So even doing a, with random control trials approach, you will face some of these challenges. Another option is to use proxies. So let's try to find outcome variables that are not affected by chance or by luck, but are correlated with our outcome of interest. And for example, we can look at common pathogens like E. coli or Salmonella, whose presence is correlated also with the risk of disease. So if you have a farm with very uh, poor hygiene, then you will expect more E. coli uh, uh, to be present in the farm. So that's another option that we've been thinking about. The problem with this option is that, well, first you need to uh, make sure that you are selecting the right pathogens, but then you also have huge costs of sampling and testing. And the reality is that we don't have, um, a, in many cases, a, a, the resources to do all this. Now, also, if we are thinking about um, unusual events and when we are thinking about risk, uh, the, the interesting part, but also the challenging part about risk is that sometimes uh, a, you will have good years and sometimes you will have bad years. So let's try to think, okay, how can we show 
the benefit of adopting biosecurity during the good years. So good year is a year where there is no outbreak. Um, we can think that farms with very low hygiene may benefit uh, from improving biosecurity because it reduces the risk of all disease. So if you have a program that is dealing with uh, FMD and you are promoting biosecurity, farmers will also have benefits for controlling mastitis, for example, that is a huge production uh, loss disease. Um, so these benefits will uh, materialize mainly on those farms that were doing very bad. But in general, if you are dealing with the average farm, probably you will require investments and the benefits on during these good years will be only marginal or even you can find a decrease in profits. And this is just an example that is looking at that in an ex ante way uh, in Uganda. And what they find is that improving biosecurity uh, at the farm node, at the production node, leads to the reduction of 6.3% uh, in profit margins per year. It's not a lot. Uh, there, is, uh, there are benefits of this, and, and you can see how this benefit materializes not just at the production node, but all, all, all along uh, the value chain uh, that in this case lead to 7% increase. But I guess the, the point of this is that it's, it's particularly when you are looking at the good years when there is no, no, no disease uh, outbreaks, then biosecurity could actually be a, a, a cost for the farm. Um, so the problem with doing just that is that we are not actually capturing the benefits of implementing biosecurity as a tool to prevent outbreaks. So what we were trying to find out is how are other risk mitigation technologies evaluated in, in the literature? And when you think about risk mitigation technologies, the, some of the first ones that come to your mind is insurance. So let's look what the crop insurance literature uh, uh, adopts to actually evaluate the impact of, of uh, getting insurance. Uh, we know when there is a, a, a drought, or uh, if this is a, a, the case of uh, crop insurance, then you will get a payment and you will say, oh, then having an insurance was a very good decision. But what, what happens if there is no drought? Well, you, you paid your insurance, you are not receiving any kind of benefit out of it. Would you say that that is a bad decision? Well, some people might say yes, some people might say no, exposed. I, is what I mean. Uh, so, but when we dig into the literature from the crop insurance, actually, to to show the benefits of insurance during these good years. So, in the case of insurance uh, of crops, is when there is no drought. Then, what they find is that households usually engage in low return activities in order to reduce the risk exposure. Okay, and this is a World Bank paper, very nice one, we definitely recommend. Um, and so basically when they get insurance, they are willing to take more risk. And that's when they start investing in fertilizer, pesticides, improved seeds. And that's where the, the, the benefits during these peaceful years are, are, are materialized. So one of the things that is important to take into account is that timing uh, for the payment of the insurance was very critical in general, and they put a lot of attention of this. So they are around the investment decisions. So, so the farmers get some liquidity and they can invest on, on the uh, on, 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 uh, high risk, high return technologies. So the question for you is, what are we doing in the livestock sector to couple biosecurity with potential drivers for improved profitability? And this is not new. I've seen some initiatives trying to link biosecurity to access to markets and other ones to certification. And what is important is that it's a certification that is meaningful to consumer. It could be linked to also uh, better genetics. Uh, we know that there are some high productive breeds that they are not I mean, they are very sensitive to low biosecurity uh, environments, but what else can we do? And this is still a question, an ongoing question. Another challenge is how to disentangle the effect of multiple biosecurity interventions if we are always promoting a package. And the challenge of not, of, of not getting these um, uh, individual effects is that then it's hard to prioritize. 
there are some options to deal with this challenge. One is through expert opinion, but this, this is usually cheap, but it can be biased depending on the experts you are asking. Uh, and another option is to run randomized control trials to assess individual practices, but these will be super expensive. And if you are looking at development projects, probably it's not going to be an option. And finally, before handing it over to, to Claire, another challenge in measuring the, the benefits of biosecurity is that there is some positive externalities to neighboring farms from, uh, derived from improving biosecurity in, in, a, in a specific farm. And let's think about this similar to uh, immune, uh, uh, immunity on herd protection with vaccination. Uh, imagine that you have all these farms with very good biosecurity around your farm, then you will have, uh, you will benefit from this because it will be challenging for diseases to get into your farm because you are kind of protected by those that are uh, uh, nearby. Now, the challenge in measuring these positive externalities is that it can be very expensive. Uh, to get baselines for all the farms and trying to identify if there is this kind, kind of effect. And it will be also hard to disentangle the effects um, a, of your program if the neighbors start mimicking practices, okay? So this, the, there is a, um, a specific term for this um, in impact evaluation, but all these become challenges that are very hard to deal with and we just presented a few. We are just talking about measuring um, uh, the impact of biosecurity interventions. I think another very good question that I saw in, in the questions that some of you already submitted while registering to the, to the webinar, um, that is how once we have measured the benefits of biosecurity, how we promote or how we use the results. And, you can think of different uh, audiences and for each audience, you will have to present the results in a different way to make it attractive. Uh, but that would be conversation for probably a follow-up webinar. I will stop now and maybe uh, hand it over to Ashma. Perfect, thanks so much, Damien. Um Unfortunately, Damien does need to leave very shortly. So we thought we'd do, we will have a um, discussion portion of the session uh, towards the end, but we thought we'd open up the floor in case there are any burning questions for Damien. Um, please feel free to ask them now. Um, otherwise we'll, we'll have to say goodbye and um, we'll move on to Claire's um, part of the session, which will be a bit more interactive as well. Cecilia, unfortunately, I can't see any everyone. If you could help me if there's any hands raised. No hands raised for now. I don't see anybody. I'll take Maybe a quick there are some the yeah, chat. to the chat. Yeah, I think, and I mean, the, all this was just to set the scene for what is coming now. And what is the, the dynamic that Claire will uh will run with you guys? Uh if you have any any other challenge uh that you have faced in in your in your programs, uh please share them with us. Uh the idea is to put all these challenges together, try to find solutions. We are trying to do something with the CADI interventions in Asia. Uh, that I, I think was already presented in this community of practice. But uh, what we're trying to do is to exploit this community of practice to get these kind of collective solutions to these challenges. Um, I, I will thank you all. Uh, feel free to contact me, but now you will have the fun part with, with Claire. Back to you, Ashma. Thanks so much, Damien. Um, and also to mention, we will, if there are any questions after the session, we'll um, open a discussion forum on the Community of Practice forum, um, sorry, platform. So um, we'll also have an opportunity to ask any questions there. Um, and I'll hand over to Claire. Thanks, Claire. Thank you so much, Damien, for that overview. So 
although there were no questions directly for Jamie, and we are going to encourage everyone to start engaging with us. So this is the point where some people get shy and some people get really excited. So we're sharing now a QR code to a virtual whiteboard called Mural. Um, so we're going to give you all a few minutes to join us on the Mural board so that we can start hearing from all of you about the experiences that you have had in trying to measure the impact of farm biosecurity or other farm interventions if you haven't worked on a biosecurity project. I will also pop in the chat the link as well and again give everyone a few minutes to join um, and then we will hand over to Daniel who will share his screen as we facilitate an interactive discussion. So please take a second. Um, you can use the QR code if you want to access on your phone, and then I will be adding the link in the chat for anyone who wants to join on your computer. Great, and while we wait for a few people to, to join us there, You'll see when you join on the mural site that I've taken uh, the liberty of summarizing a few of the challenges that Damien outlined in his presentation that we have experienced and identified through our work to date. As I said, when we were designing our approach for measurement for the TRANSFORM project, we really wanted to understand what the challenges were that other teams had faced and what solutions they had implemented to overcome that. And in my conversations with Damien, we first thought that we would do a literature review of uh, challenges in measuring the the impact of biosecurity practices, but also the challenge in measuring reduced risk, which we know a lot of our biosecurity projects want to reduce that risk uh, to human and animal health. But what we found is that there is actually a dearth of literature. So we did not find any uh, summaries uh, or documents that were really focused on the challenge of measuring um, the impact of biosecurity projects or on focused on risk reduction in the areas we're working. And so that's really why we wanted to bring the conversation to a group of practitioners. So very excited to hear from all of you. So I think I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Daniel so we can start the discussion to hear from all of you. Sounds good. Thank you very much. So in a minute you will share, you will see my screen where I believe there are already many, many participants who joined us. All these, these moving arrows are, are participants of the webinar. And the question uh, we are looking into, you heard a number of challenges from Damien, right? So for example, he mentioned good years, bad years. How does that impact the evaluation? Of course, depends on the timing of the program. He also mentioned, for example, the, the positive externalities. What about all those neighboring farms? How do you measure the impact of of, um, of the biosecurity measures the neighbors uh, um, applied, for example. So the task here is to feel free to create your own post-its and then move it to the right side of the screen and the scale, or also use the existing post-its. Claire, is there something you, you want to add in terms of what, what we are looking at? What are the post-its you created? You just unmute yourself and then go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, yes. So I see a lot of people are already starting to ch chime in and share your thoughts. So some of the post-its uh, that are already there are a high level summary of the challenges that Damien outlined in his presentation. But we're looking for now is for you to add any comments. So you can use the sticky notes for any comments that you may have, but also to um, share any additional challenges that we may have forgotten. So for example, one common challenge I could think of with any development um, or probably animal health project would be data quality and willingness to share data. 
Um, but we, we focused on the specific ones for measuring the impact of biosecurity. So please go, feel free to take a few minutes. We'll give you a few minutes to reflect and to, to add in your challenges that you've experienced from your projects. Um, and if you're having any challenges accessing Mural or commenting on the sticky notes, you can also feel free to raise your hand here and, and share with us um, that way, or you can add the challenges in the chat and we can copy them over for you. So whatever is the most uh, effective way for you to, to share that, please feel free. And so we're just gonna give a couple of minutes here um, really to, to give um, an opportunity for everyone to fill these in. And then what we'll do is um, take a look summarize. And then we really also wanted to do a voting exercise where we can say which we think are the most important or significant challenges. So with that, we'll just give a, a few minutes um, for everyone to input their responses because I see a lot of activity on the board. So do I. And in the meantime, I have tried creating uh, sticky notes myself. So just for those of you who yep. need a Go bit ahead. of help on, on how to do that. So on, your, on my screen, you can see on the on the left side, this black bar here. And the second one is a sticky note. So you can click on it, choose a color of, of, uh, of your choice, and then just start creating a challenge. And then you can just grab them and drag them around the screen as you, as you prefer. And if you change your mind, you can just right click on it and delete, or you can use also one of the existing ones down here. There are empty ones, the blue ones, feel free to use them as well. Also to mention, you can please feel free to add more than one. You're not limited in terms of how many challenges you can list. Absolutely. <laughs> Claire, would you like to introduce us to the to the right uh, side of the screen? What are the four yes. zones? Yes, <laughs> sure. Mean? I see some people have are are working ahead and moving. So uh, on the right side of the screen, we were going to use as a next step to prioritize um, the challenges based on how um, important we think they are and how feasible we think it would be for us to actually. Um, address these challenges. So trying to come up with a, a framework or solution or other solutions. Um, so you, you can feel free to move those around, but otherwise we'll do that as a next step. Perfect. That's very clear. So for now, we are focusing on creating challenges. Of course, from your own experience, the more practical, concrete they are, the better. And as a next step, we're going to place them according Great. to their impact and feasibility. Claire, over yep. to you. So just as, please do continue just for a couple more minutes, maybe two more minutes, we'll let folks um, continue adding in challenges that you've experienced. But uh, I'll start just sharing some of the inputs that we've heard from, um, that we can see from the group. So one, one really good point is that unfortunately, even professionals neglect basic biosecurity practices. Uh, and so one thing I can see here is the challenge of actually getting the practice implemented properly to then be able to know um, when we're measuring it, if, if it was or was not implemented correctly, that would obviously yield different results. And so when we're not working in a controlled environment where we are able to really effectively monitor the day-to-day -day implementation, then it's challenging to know if we're effectively uh, capturing those outcomes if it's implemented incorrectly. Um, another point is challenges when we're only looking at one disease pathogen. So uh, we don't know the holistic impact. So an example might be we have a one or more biosecurity interventions that the project might be looking specifically just at E. coli or salmonella, but there are likely broader impacts that um, that those interventions are having on the farm. So actually either missing out on positive benefits that there may be or um, not seeing the full, of, the full effect there. Yep. 
Yep. Another one is that farmers often implement different biosecurity practices. So that's something we've seen on our own transform project where we are disease agnostic. So we are not um, introducing biosecurity practices for just one disease, but rather a whole suite of practices that will make improvements on the farm. And we have noticed from our follow-up data collection that each farmer will choose the practice that was missing on their farm or is perhaps most feasible for them in terms of cost and other factors. And so that does make it difficult when you're trying to look at the outcomes that they experience, having to track back and look at um, disaggregate based on those different practices. Great. Um, so we're, we can continue with having everyone add in some of the challenges that you've had, but maybe while we um, let people, because I see that people are still adding in sticky notes, I'll, I'll pause here and ask from the group if anyone who has added a sticky note would like to share their specific experience, the challenge that they've added. Um, please, we welcome you to, to unmute yourselves and share a bit of your perspective. Great idea, Claire. I think you all have a lot to say, and we've definitely talked to up, talked enough, and, and we don't want these sessions to be too presentation heavy. So the, the idea here is you just raise your hand and we will give you the floor to, to share something you you have you want you want to add to, to the challenge. You of course the sticky note is so short that you you cannot uh, expand too much on, on those. So please. Hands up if you if you have something to to share. Actually, Daniel, we might even just get them. Please unmute yourself since we can't see anyone's hands up with the screen being shared. So please feel free to just just jump in and um, share any experiences that you might have. Yeah, sounds good. I'm trying to scroll down on the list of participants to make sure I'm not missing anyone. It's it's a it's a quiet group, but we see everyone's active on the the mural. So exactly. Richard, is there something you want to share? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I didn't initially go for it because I thought Claire described my my post it very well. Um, the problem I had with my intervention studies linked to biosecurity have always been that um, we've only concentrated on one pathogen. And so, you know, although we, we get a nice output on that, but if you're trying to sell this to a farmer or to a vet, you want to know all the benefits. You want to be able to say, this is going to cost you a lot of money, but these are the benefits. And so for the scientific community, it's interesting, but for a farmer, it's it's still yeah not enough evidence for them. Yeah, thanks, Richard. That's a really great point. And, and one thing um, that Damien previewed is, as, a, as the next step is, what do we do with that data and how does it actually influence adoption? And so, you know, we do have to think about that up front when we're thinking about the measurement approach um, that will not only give us the holistic picture of impact, but also then give us the data that will help further adoption and sustainability. So yeah, great point. Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah, I, I see um, another another challenge that I think is common that we face across projects someone added is knowing what the best outcome metric or metrics are um, and really deciding what those would be. Something, you know, since we noticed there was a lack of literature on this topic from the community was also um, there weren't consistent frameworks that we could reference and certainly not a, a set of outcome metrics that we could reference. So really picking those metrics that will be um, help you understand the impact for your context, but also to the point that Richard mentioned, will give you data that is useful for your different audiences, whether it's policymakers or farmers or others. Anyone else want to jump in and, and share their challenge? Otherwise, why don't we move on to the matrix? No, before that, 
Cuastras. Devoting. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, people. Have sorry, been... Cuastras has a question. Thank oh, you, sure. uh, Daniel, and thank you, uh, Claire. Uh, actually, we have also experienced the same uh, um, uh, issue. Uh, last time, we, I think, uh, around uh, three or four months uh, ago, we had conducted such kind of uh, intervention assessment on voluntary uh, farm biosecurity. And one of the issues is uh, getting uh, reliable data. Actually, it was also mentioned by uh, Claire earlier. So uh, getting a data which is really representative uh, mm -hmm. of um, uh, what's happening on the ground mm -hmm. is uh, uh, an issue. So well, this can be uh, mentioned, especially in uh, LMIC uh, settings. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. That's, that's a great challenge. Uh, can I just make a comment? Um, yes. Jane Gibbons, a uh, veterinary epidemiologist. I think one of the biggest issues is knowing what they do when you're not there. So an intervention yes. study, for example, where you have a, a poultry farm and you want them to use foot dips or change their clothing or whatever, they do it when you visit, but all the rest of the time you don't. And then when your intervention apparently has no effect, you don't know whether it was the intervention that was wrong or the yes. application of it. And I think that's one of the biggest ones um, to try and get around. Yes, thanks, Jane. Great point. And um, another, so you're you're saying it can also be a challenge when you go to to visit the farm. They might do it correctly. Um, another challenge would be if you don't actually go and visit the farms um, to document and take photos and see for yourself. When in one of our examples, a farmer said that they had. Um, added a foot bath after the training. And when our team went to visit the field, the foot bath was much too small for anyone's foot to actually go in. So rendering it ineffective. So yeah, really, really great point that we um, need to have a way to understand if practices are being adopted correctly and then implemented correctly over time. Thanks. Great, Claire. I think yeah, for now, I don't see any other hands. So I think, uh, oh, just Wonderful. when I said that, there is Peter Oba. Do we have time for that, Sarah? Is, is that okay? Just another comment? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go Peter, ahead. go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for this presentation. Uh, this is something that I, I we have not yet experienced here in Uganda, but um, uh, uh, based on our, um, uh, you know, Field, field work that we have been doing here. Uh, <clears throat> we have, um, this is part of the interventions that we, uh, we want to assess uh, the impact of uh, biosecurity uh, interventions on, on productivity indicators uh, um, in the pig value chain. Now, <clears throat> one of the, uh, the difficulties I anticipate is that um, uh, you may find that, um, uh, first of all, most of the smallholder farmers uh, uh, are reluctant to adopt uh, this biosecurity security practices because uh, basically they, 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 maybe to them it does not make any, any, any much economic sense. Uh, for example, to put up um, uh, a foot bath, uh, if, if the farmer only has a very small number of uh, birds or, or pigs. And then the other element that he, he, we also want to, uh, to encounter in the field is that you know, most of the smallholder farmers are, are so diverse in terms of, uh, you know, the, the size of the farms, but also in terms of practices, farm level biosecurity practices. So you find that even, even though we try to, to encourage them to adopt this practice, there they, they, they is a, a very high level of diversity that when it comes to evaluation of the impact of uh, this biosecurity practices, you find that the, the, the number at different categories is so small uh, to be able to to, 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 to be able to be used for an, an, an analysis. Of course, the other issue would be to increase the sample size. Uh, of course, that could also be limited by the, the, the amount of resources that are available. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Peter, for sharing multiple challenges that you have faced um, when when trying to collect data and then have relevant or statistically significant findings. Hello. Gerald, oh, sorry. Um, 
someone else was Hello. speaking up. Go ahead. Hello, this is Patrick. Uh, I just want to appreciate the presentation and I just want to say, if you can just look at the way how we are doing, it is good, but I would just want also to put up this uh, particular need or, uh, hello, I hear him. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Patrick. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So I wanted to see if you can just look at the way how we have come up with this biosecurity. It is centered on the way how we can improve um, um, on the food or on the on the on the on the farms at within. But there is this also biosecurity of conserving nature. I don't know if you can just sense of like maybe we are finishing up with our green coverage, which we as uh, as 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 the human being we really need. I don't know how can we bring it on into consideration. I don't know. I submit my my question. I don't know if you have got it, what I'm trying to communicate. Yes, yes definitely. And that's a very good point. Um, I believe you said, Patrick, thanks for raising that because um, more and more frequently, it's, it seems that the discussions are around the importance of taking a one health approach, which does involve the environment. But I think this gets back to the point Richard was raising where a lot of studies focus on um, maybe one pathogen or one disease we're trying to address or one um, outcome area. And um, even though we're being encouraged to take a one health approach, we are not necessarily always looking at um, the impact on animals, humans, and the environment. So I don't, I don't have the answer, but it's a great point to, to flag that we could be taking even a more holistic, not just holistic on the farm, but uh, thinking about the surrounding environment. As Damien said, there are a lot of positive externalities that can happen from interventions. We can have a spillover on the other animals and surrounding farms, but also the surrounding environment. So it's really, I don't have the answer, but it's a great point to flag for the group. Um, maybe we just take comment from one more person. I think Gerald had um, his hand up if you wanted to share. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. So I'm Gerald, uh, coordinating activities of the Virtual Learning Center for Eastern Africa region. So we recently ran a course on uh, farm biosecurity in the region. And um, something that I consistently saw coming up in the discussions with, uh, we had colleagues from around nine countries. Um, the practices in the region, such as communal grazing and uh, sharing of uh, bulls in terms of breeding and herd improvement, these are some of the things that um, happen a lot and attributing risks to this because of course there are risks in terms of disease introduction. So attributing risks to such practices and many other cultural things that happen is uh, one of the things that possibly is a major challenge uh, that I saw being highlighted a lot. Thank you, over. Great, thanks so much, Gerald. And yes, that's its attribution is one of those perpetual measurement challenges. So thank you for, for sharing that for us. Um, Indeed. I, thank you. Thank you, Gerald. And thanks for all the other participants for the for the questions and, and, and comments. It's great to, to have you uh, sharing these experiences. What I suggest we do in the next couple of minutes is focus on the on the matrix on the right side of the screen if that's okay with you claire and i know we promised uh um 10 minutes just for just for your comments and sharing experiences but luckily we have the community of practice on animal biosecurity and you can find the link in the chat box very shortly to that community and i suggest we we move this conversation over there and, and keep discussing on this community so so we are not limited by time but the next uh uh, four to five minutes. If it's okay with you, Claire, let's focus on the on the matrix. Yes, and to help us move to the matrix, we are going to ask you to vote. So we're going to ask you first to vote for the two challenges. You get two votes that you think are most important for us to address. So I'm going to start the voting now. You click once on the sticky note that you think is the most important challenge and it will capture uh, your votes and then share for us the findings. And what you see on my screen is, of course, my voting. 
<laughs> yes. So Daniel, don't influence everyone, but <laughs> that's fair enough. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. And once everyone uh, is done with voting, <laughs> would you like me to still share my screen, Claire, or would you like to share the yes. results? Yeah, you can I just keep sharing my screen. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. I see 28 people are voting, 27. Ah, the voting is in mural. Um, so that's where you can click, just double click um, on the sticky note that you think has captures the challenge that is most important for us to address as practitioners. If you do not have mural open um, or could not access it, you can also feel free to add what you think is the most important challenge into the chat so we can still capture. Okay, for the sake of time, even though we want to get more and more inputs, um, I will end the voting session now and see where we stand. It says people are still voting, but we'll just go ahead. Great. So, um, Daniel, do you want to go ahead and summarize for the group? Yeah, sure. So we got the most votes on the challenge, hard to know what behavior happens when not observed. Example, a use of food dip that got seven votes. Then there are three votes. I, I realize people are still voting, so I'm not sure if this will be updated or we are seeing a snapshot of a few minutes ago. But what got three votes is lack of training on biosecurity. So there's a training need. Um, there are two votes on quantifying averted losses, which are highly variable. Mm. Also two votes on most effective biosecurity practices might be different across countries. So the difference between countries, of course, geographical regions as well, sectors and, and production types, just a valid, valid point. The term biosecurity is poorly understood. So so even the, the word itself uh, is, is, is a challenge. Yeah, go ahead, Claire, if you want to comment. No, 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just affirming. Great yes. uh, issues that, that might that uh, that my intervention studies have assessed only one pathogen, no study of holistic effects. That only got, also got two votes. Um, also, the the fact that biosecurity cannot rely on incentives but requires public regulation, since there is no glory in prevention. I think I really like that the the person also put that in bold. There is no glory in prevention. I think it's a very, very, very valid point. Attribution is highly complex, of course. That also got two votes. And there are a lot of lot of other sticky notes. We've got, yep. we've got one vote. We were probably all voting for our own on that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to vote. I know others are voting, so we'll be able to still collect those. What Damien and I will do after the fact is prioritize these um, on the matrix that we had to the right, where we can look at what challenges were considered most important, which ones may be most feasible to address. And then that will inform some of our thinking on next steps about how we might develop a framework that could actually be tested during um, transforms midterm evaluation. So I think with that, um, I will just share my screen uh, to give a quick overview of our next steps. And then we will close out because I know we are just about at time here. Um, let me just share my screen. One more time. Great. So again, 
we just really quickly, I know we're at time, so we'll wrap up um, in terms of our next step. So today we really wanted to help start understanding the challenges and um, move towards identifying potential solutions. So really understanding from all of you as practitioners what the challenges are that you have been facing in the work that you do every day. So we also have a follow-up survey that we want to distribute um, that Ashma will be sending around and um, we can share in the chat as well as on the Community of Practice website to solicit any additional thoughts and feedback from you or identify um, other, other practitioners that we should speak with. And also you'll have the opportunity to volunteer if you want to continue being involved in the discussion. So we'll be facilitating some key informant interviews and focus group discussions to further uh, explore these challenges. And then as Ashma mentioned at the beginning of the call, we'll share back with the group what some of the key takeaways were um, and then move towards developing a proposed framework that we will pilot um, and share back results and recommendations with the group as well. So with that, I just wanna thank you all so much for taking the time to share your input with us as it will be really instrumental in helping us as we move forward uh, on our respective projects. And with that over, um, back to Ashma and Daniel. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, big, big, big thank you to you and of course to um, Damien for joining us today and putting on um, an, a great session. I think um, we've had really good engagement from um, all of our participants. And as Claire mentioned, um, I will email everyone that had uh, registered and attended um, with the recording of today's session, with the um, PowerPoint, as I know a few people have also requested that. Um, we'll keep the mural board open in case there is anything else that people would like to add. I'll, I'll um, share that link as well. Um, and some of those accompanying resources that Damien had also mentioned in his presentation. Um, for uh, anyone that is still here, um, also just to plug that we have a um, another webinar next week. Um, we're keeping busy in this community of practice. Um, I will throw the link in the chat to register. Um, and thank you all so much for, for your engagement and um, for attending today. And hopefully we'll see you at our follow-up sessions that we'll plan for next year um, and our event for next week. <laughs>